and welcome to another episode of Guides to Brides, the wedding podcast. Now, let's be honest, besides the venue and the wedding dress, one of the main things that we all remember about a wedding is the food. It can be canapes, it can be a buffet, it could be food trucks, whatever your preference. But I, I personally think that it's one of the things that we really remember about a wedding. Um, Because of this, there is more to talk about than just what kind of food you want. And that's why I've brought in an expert guest this week to talk all things wedding catering. Welcome to Karen from Kemp and Kemp. Hi there. Hi, Karen. Um, Would you mind introducing yourself and Kemp and Kemp to our listeners? Yes, of course. I am Karen Kemp and um, together with my husband, Richard, we run a primarily wedding catering company. Um, called Kemp and Kemp Catering. Um, We've been um, in business now for 12 years and if I could just blow our own trumpet for a bit we're sort of award-winning. We like to think that to a certain extent we sort of change the face of wedding catering from that sort of very staid plated you know bit of old melon roast beef dinner cheesecake to a much more relaxed bespoke Um, experience for everybody so really in a nutshell that that's me at the moment I'm the foodie bit so I'm everything food related and Richard does all the boring back of house sums sums, (laughs) things like that bit (laughs) you get the fun part part of eating and testing and serving and creating you know I'm fantastically creative so yeah Amazing. Well, I think after that, we'll just dive straight in. Um, You know, I'm not a food expert myself, so I think we've sort of decided this is going to be more of a QA and a format than just a general discussion. Um, So first things first, I think we should start with explaining what you would normally bring, why you would normally bring in an outside caterer uh, for your wedding. I mean, because some venues, they don't allow you to, do they? No. I think, I I mean, if you have gone down the venue route of the classic, you know, hotel that does weddings and things like that, um, then the what you know, an outside caterer is not something that you would need because it's all involved in your sort of package, as it were. But basically, um, if you have what's called a dry hire venue, a dry hire venue is basically just a phrase used to describe a venue that just provides you really with a, a blank canvas, you know, the use of their space. And you are then going to choose all of your suppliers, everything from obviously the food, the catering, sometimes the loos, mobile loos, florists, everything. So it's not for the faint hearted, but it's great because Mm -hmm. you get to be, you know, as I say, you have a blank canvas, you can be fantastically creative, you have the freedom to choose your suppliers rather than have them dictated for you. Um, And yeah, so that's basically it. I mean, there are slightly different levels of it. Some venues have a free for all. So you can literally, you know, choose your own caterer, totally. Mm -hmm. And some venues have a list of preferred caterers, caterers they've worked with in the past that they would prefer that you choose from. And that's because they might have specific insurances in place, isn't it? Yes, it's usually either, it's about a combination of things. Um, cater, um, like everybody, we all like working with people that we know and love, basically, and, tr- and trust. Because don't forget, that caterer is going to reflect on that venue. Because the, the majority of the wedding guests won't know that the catering is not linked to the venue, that it's completely separate. So it's important for the venue, insurance-wise, yes, that they, they have somebody that reflects their standard. Mm-hmm. And also isn't going to trash the place, you know, that's going to respect the space that has been given, um, not leave food waste and all that malarkey. So, yeah, that's basically it. Amazing. And so when you're thinking about choosing an outside caterer, say I've just booked a dry high wedding venue, what would the process of that be? How would you recommend going about searching for the caterer? Okay, so obviously, if they have a preferred list, you would just contact them, or you you would be daft not to contact everybody on the list, unless there's somebody clearly that's not for you. Sometimes Mm -hmm. it's quite obvious, but yeah, I mean, it might be that one of them is a food truck, and you're not really fancy. Sure, absolutely, or you know, Asian wedding for six hundred people, or something like that. So, Mm -hmm. for you know, if they've got a preferred list, then that's how you would start off. You would just email the caterer, look at their websites. Most caterers have a sort of form on the website. Start to build up your own picture of 
of what you want from your caterer. But your initial steps really are making an inquiry, be it from the caterer's website, you've done your research or you've got a preferred list. The caterer then will respond to you. So in our case, we are we pride ourselves on being fantastically responsive. And that's important, you know, because this is somebody that you're going to form a very important relationship with who can make or break your wedding. Absolutely. And, and, you know, you need to feel from the start that you haven't got somebody that you email and it disappears into the deep blue yonder. You know, you don't want to be chasing anybody. You want responsiveness right from the beginning. So the caterer would generally then send you what we call anyway, an initial response that says, hi, thank you so much for your inquiry. Yes, we're free on your date. They could give you minimum amounts of information or because we're great wafflers or we like to give people <laughs> a lot of information from the start, we usually would tell them a little bit about us. Um, we're very chatty with people. So that's the process. And basically, if the initial response lights everybody's candle, you like the tone of it, you've had the response, the price band at that stage, because that's all it is, is about where you want to be. Then you start engaging more. Amazing. And so when you're talking about price band there, yeah. Yeah. it's obviously, as always in these discussions, I say it's a sliding scale because it really depends on what you're wanting. If I would like to have a typical um, wedding menu, say with a couple of canapes, a three course meal yeah. and some sort of evening food, sure. would you say there is a sort of typical price for that? Um, it's a tricky one, this. Let me tell you what you shouldn't do first as, as your sort of person planning, you know, as the bride. What you shouldn't do in your head is think, right, but if I go to my lo local favourite restaurant or something, I know that I can have a main course for, I don't know, £25 and a starter for 10 and blah, blah, blah. You, that's what you shouldn't do. Get that out of your head because outside catering is completely different to a restaurant setup. Um without overcomplicating it, every time we go out to a, a venue, a marquee or whatever, the caterer is essentially building a restaurant in every single situation. That's a good way of thinking of it actually, isn't it? Because yeah. you, you are, you, especially yeah. if it's a marquee, you're yeah. bringing everything with you're you. Building a restaurant and you're building a restaurant unlike a, a real restaurant, a, you know, a bricks and mortar restaurant where, you know, you're gearing yourself up for, you know, table four once the starter at 7.30. You're about to serve a hundred odd people all at the same time. Okay, that's a different story, but it's a lot of pressure. So to go back to the costing of it, we are slightly different. I can answer it first by saying typically for us, for 2023, a rough cost for a 100 guests, and I'll tell you why I'm giving you guest numbers in a minute, for three courses would be £60 a head plus VAT. Okay. okay. Now, when we send out our initial response, this band we talk about is really to make the bride feel comfortable that when if she wants to go forward we're all talking in the same ballpark mm -hmm. things will tweak and change depending on guest numbers but we're all in the guest you know in the same ballpark basically yeah so that's okay. yeah that, that's that's a really good way of putting it because obviously you know we've we've talked about price before on the podcast with various different things we talked about it in our cake episode we talked about it in our flowers episode yes. you know it, it's one of those things that really is a sliding scale and it depends on what yes. you as a couple are looking for isn't yeah it? I mean interestingly with us I mean you know I am from Kemp and Kemp so I'm just let me just tell you because it might just explain a little bit lots of caterers ba basically do do a right if you want the beef it's x pounds if you want the chicken it's x pounds we don't do that because we felt it was complicated to do that and because we want people to look at a menu and go I can have anything I want on this menu so what we do instead is we say you can have everything anything you want as long as you don't want me to fly lobster in from Denmark or something you can have whatever you want because the price I am going to give you is based upon your guest numbers that's why I said for an average 100 guest wedding 
let me just explain that without being too technical. There are some costs that remain the same whether you have 30 guests or 300 guests. They're fixed costs. And, and they, they are things like the chef, the manager, the transport, the equipment, all of that sort of thing. And then the food costs and the staffing costs go up and down. So we just think it's simpler to go for, you know, for basically the less guests you have, the fewer guests you have, the higher the cost per head, because it's all of the costs divided by those people. That sounds much more complicated than it is when it's written down to you. And that's why we do, this is your, the broad brush. And then when we get down to nitty gritty, we can give you a very specific price. And we do that in the very, very early stages. So there are no hidden extras. Yeah, I think that's a really good point and probably a good way of identifying um, caterers that are right for you is by actually going, you know what, this is our budget uh, yeah. for, for food. Um, and so in which case, per head, we're looking at around this much and just sort of finding someone that you get on with that yeah. are in your price point before yeah. going further, because, you know, yeah. you're not going to be in everyone's price point. And no, of course. Gonna, one caterer or another aren't you yeah that's absolutely why we do that thing very early on and it's also why nobody likes a hidden extra no so again you know nobody likes to pay their deposit thinking that's great that's all sorted only to find when they get to the end the caterer actually didn't include waiting staff and that's extra and believe you me I've heard stories of that mm -hmm. so we we basically give a very very straightforward price there's your 100 guests in 2023 at 60 pounds a head plus that and it includes xyz blah, 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 and lists all of those things mm. yeah that's really really helpful and so in terms of when you are looking for the right caterer for you what yeah. kind of elements might you consider aside from cost um, right. Well, I suppose, seeing as we're talking about food, one of the main things is, I would suggest, um, being involved in your menu creation. You know, if you are a food lover, and food is an important part of your wedding, and for most people it is, for some it isn't. But I think if the people who are likely to be listening to this podcast who actually are not going to a venue with a set package they are more likely to be very aware of of the food that they want at their wedding so I think the the sort of the empathetic the empathy of your caterer the ability to um, be involved in the creation of your menu to know that you're if you suddenly talk about I don't know I don't know some obscure dish the caterer nods and understands it or if they don't they can find out about it um making sure that you're getting the exact menu that you want mm. really that you're given lots of options um you know you're not just you don't just have one consultation and then the menu is that's it you know that you still have options within it and that the caterer can look after you know these days there are millions of dietary requirements allergies all sorts of things popping up all over the place that the caterer is confident and happy that they can look after all of those people the same. Mm. I think that's a really good point about the allergies as well. Again, we talked about this in our cake episode recently, uh, where, you know, you, you have got to cater for those allergies. It, it's, oh. it's the law. So if, if your yeah. caterer isn't confident, then you really should be quite careful there. You should be. And it's important as well, I think, with the, the allergies or dietary requirements, you, the bride, is going to pay the same amount of money for that guest as you are for the you know the meat eating guests or you know whatever and it's therefore really important that the caterer treats that bit with a respect but also um with as much aplomb as they would creating the main event dish as it were so mm. you don't want your vegans just having a, a stuffed mushroom somewhere because the caterer hasn't got enough imagination to come up with fantastic vegan food um, and, you know, they, they, it, they, they, we don't want klaxons over people's heads either saying, you know, gluten free or whatever. So wherever possible, you know, the caterer should try and inc incorporate as much of, of the dietary and allergy requirements as they can into the main event without the need for too many different dishes. 
Yeah, I think that's a really good tip, especially about the clacks and being above someone's head. That was something when I spoke to um, the people who are doing our wedding food was one of the things I was like, I don't want all the vegetarians to have vegetarian over really? there. Christ, Christ. Yeah, right. and, uh, it's one of those things as well that, you know, if you don't want people to feel like they're being singled out no. either, they're there to enjoy themselves. That's the whole yeah. reason you've invited exactly. them. Exactly. And also they're there to enjoy themselves and they're there to also be relaxed that you have a competent caterer that isn't going to, uh, you know, inadvertently serve them something they can't eat. Yeah, totally. <laughs> leads us on nicely to what are the benefits of being able to choose an outside caterer okay the benefits are of, i'm bound to say this aren't i they are many and varied <laughs> it's slightly <laughs> biased for you <laughs> on a slight bias i will grant you okay i mean first of all you want to be able to um not have something foisted upon you okay so that's important it's a as we keep saying it's a vitally important part of your day the food and it, you don't want to just have um you know somebody's menu you, you you want to be able to play a part in your menu the things that sort of lead on from that and um, are that you know you can um choose things or discuss things that have specific relevance to you so you got married, uh, got engaged, you know, in Thailand. So, you know, do you want to ha have a little Thai green curry involved somewhere, maybe as a canapé rather than the whole thing? Or, you know, you got, um, you know, you where did you go for your first meal together mm -hmm. as a couple, your first proper meal? I'll give you a good example of this. You know, we did a wedding where they went to a, a, a lovely restaurant in London called the Duck and Waffle, which is on top of the Oxo uh, Tower. I think it's the Oxo Tower. And they wanted me to recreate that menu. OK, you wouldn't get that if you didn't have a an outside caterer and be a very creative outside caterer who can think out of the box. So I went onto Duck and Waffle's websites. I mean, it's basically what it says. It's a confit duck leg and a waffle and an egg on top of it and recreated that for their wedding menu because that's where they first went. He either proposed there or they first went as a couple when they were serious or first date or something like that. So things that have specific meaning to you can only come from a good outside caterer. Um, again, you know, you can, you have a, a much better chance of being able to incorporate heritage or culture or family members recipes. I have been asked to cook, you know, great grandma's crumble, for example. How did I know you were going to say crumble? <laughs> all grannies make crumbles, it's a fact. <laughs> um, and famously, you know, we once had a wedding where the bride was, um, the bride's family were Iranian, so actually Persian at the time. Um, her mother was Yorkshire and she was marrying an Aussie and she was a, just a good old English girl. And so we married all of those things together. You know, they had pre-choices of a main course. The Aussie, the Aussie choice, they just wanted steak, of course, <laughs> or lamb, but they had steak. The Iranian what element was that they wanted to have an Iranian lamb curry, very, very specialised. And I think we did little beef Yorkshires for canapes. So I suppose I'm, I'm waffling on a bit here, but in the, it, you just get much more involvement and much more chance to create your own menu when you have a good outside caterer. I, what I always say is the world is your oyster. Really, it is. And if I can make it, and it can scale up, you can have it. I think, yeah, that that's really, really great. It's, it's that ability to be creative, ability to sort of, as you say, heritage is so important. Yeah. Being able to recognize your heritage in, in a menu in multiple ways, sure. you know, it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to be one type of cuisine, does it? No, it's not, it doesn't have to be themed because again, often these things don't work for themed, you know, because if you, you know, you went trekking in Japan or something, nine times out of 10, uh, you know, if you've got 100 wedding guests, 80 of them, including your granny and your granddad, are not going to want to eat sushi or something like that. So it's all about incorporating little elements and little nods 
to those things rather than themed. Yeah, and I think as well in, in terms of everyone wants to make their wedding day more personal, don't they? So yeah. just being able to recognise that kind of aspect and subtly as well. So it's, it might not be obvious to your guests, but you know. So. You know, and also, you know, I think as well, you know, lots of your guests, you know, you, these, you, the bride and groom, are, have done entertaining in your home, no doubt. You've got a group of friends who you go out with or you might travel with. So lots of your guests do actually, you know, it can be subtle, but lots of your guests do think, oh, God, they've chosen beef bourguignon because that's what they always have on Christmas Eve, for example. Um, you know, we had another client who wanted me to do some, I can't even think where it comes from, I think Sheffield, and it's called Parno Chicken or something, and you get it in a chip shop with squeezy, melty cheese on. I mean, to God, it's it's probably <laughs> absolutely vile, but it, <laughs> delicious in a, in a very bad way, if you know what I mean, like a yeah. fried Mars bar or something like that. Anyway, we did it, and it was sort of an in-joke. They didn't have it as a main course, they had it as a canopy. And it was an in-joke because the bride apparently gets slightly squiffy on a Saturday night and always goes to the chip shop for <laughs> all that. You know, and that's great fun, I think. You yeah, know, and I it's, think. it's a great way to add a personal touch. I mean, you yeah. know, just because she gets a bit drunk on a Saturday night and she likes to enjoy her cheesy chips. Yeah, you know, exactly. That's, that's a really nice way of exactly. Uh, it. So when it comes to choosing the right outside caterer, I know we've kind of touched on this and you mentioned that the caterer should be sort of a person that you kind of get on with. I mean, I've got a little story as well myself. When I was first starting to look at venues, um, I actually contacted um, a couple of the catering companies that uh, were aligned with those venues that I was visiting and one of them didn't come back to me for two weeks mm. you know so that imme that immediately for me was like no thank you but at the same time I think it should be uh, important for couples to sort of understand what makes what you should feel like when you pick your caterer well I mean exactly we have touched on it before um, people buy off people that's a cliche klaxon but people do <laughs> and if you take you know some things I you know it's the same you know a, a wedding is such a personal thing and it's such a big day and it's so hopefully unrepeatable that everything has to be spot on and I think you know a, a caterer that doesn't reply is downright disrespectful to be honest and or has got so much business they don't need it which is either way is daft and horrible to, for the bride but I think that responsiveness empathy does the caterer is the caterer honest that's a really interesting one does the caterer tell you anything you want to get your business and then it all goes you know but you, it doesn't quite all ring true you know does the caterer manage your expectations rather that's than say, a really good one that yeah. is a really Good one. Can you, would you mind just divulging that slightly? Yes. So in other words, so, okay. So um, a good one, actually. I mean, it, it may only just apply to us as a caterer and the way we do things, but a few people ask me, have asked me for sorbet as a sort of palate cleanser, you know, a fourth course or whatever. It is nigh on impossible to do sorbet in the sort of settings we are talking about. A lot... I have made the mistake, everything I do, I've learned from making a, a terrible mistake of offering sorbet and they took it. And it was a red hot day in a Cheshire marquee going from a hot catering tent into a hot marquee with a sorbet that by the time it had got to the first table was a puddle. So mm -hmm. now when people say that to me, could they have that or could they have that? I just say, I can offer you, I can suggest lots of other things, but I can't give you that sorbet. And this is the reason why. Rather than say, yes, 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 of course, and then disappoint them. And when you do that, your clients, your brand room, nearly always thank you for it because they don't know. They hadn't thought about it. Well, We've really, probably never done this before. No. Half the time. So no. it's one of those. And they things. don't know the limit. You know, I think what's important for, again, for brides to remember is the limitations of the venue, the marquee. There are no freezers. So we have to bring one in. But the biggest thing is this it, it's hot. It's going to melt. Ice cream does not stay ice cream in a hot, 
you know, marquee catering kitchen into a hot room. So those are the sort of management of expectations. That's a very specific example. Things like tastings, um, tasting sessions, people quite rightly want a tasting session. You know, tell them at what point in the process that is going to take place. Tell them what it consists of, whether you're going to charge for it or not. Mm. Be very upfront about these things. Those are all managing your client's expectations, which is great for the client, but also much easier for the caterer, because then you don't have, you know, misunderstandings later down the line. Absolutely. And I think that that's perfectly explained and you know the the fact that you've got to you have actually there are limitations there's going to be limitations in everything you do for your wedding you know that could be budget that could be style um there's all sorts so if you know what your limitations are in the first place and that's going to make your planning so much easier yeah it is and i don't you know no caterer wants to say no because there's, you, you know, your, your bride and groom are loved up and raring to go and they want the moon. No caterer wants to say no, but it's always better to say no if you think I can't actually do this and deliver it very well. Exactly. I mean, like, you know, there would be certain cultural dishes, for example, that you might not be able to do yourself just because just because of the techniques or the, the yeah. ingredients that are required. So, you know, it's just it's just being able to understand what you can and cannot do and the limitations there. And as a couple, I yeah. think like myself included, just being able to sort of understand what you can and can't do and why that is. It's yeah. just your life so much easier exactly and the world is full of choices so you know if, if that caterer doesn't like your candle because they can't do sorbet then there'll be another one who'll say they can I very much doubt it but they'll say they can I, I think it's you know again it's back to that rela- what you're doing when you choose a caterer is relationship building the same you know it is a creative process food the same as floristry the same as the dress it's not about a mobile loo and whether they've got you know jimmy chu flip-flops in there or or whatever (laughs) it's a very creative um personal process and so it's it's back to that thing i keep saying do you actually like this caterer do you like the cut of their jib do you like the sound of them do you even like the look of them occasionally you know because they're going to be working really closely with you and I think that's a that's a really good point as well and so I think it kind of leads nicely to the next question I've got here which is what can you expect your um your budget to include uh what sorry what can you expect your um the cost of your catering to include okay all caterers are different but what it should what what is really important is that it is spelt out from the beginning what Mm -hmm. is included so as a as an absolute broad brush (laughs) clearly the food um (laughs) the staff OK, so your your quote should include all the staff that that caterer thinks that they need for your wedding. So in our case, for example, it would include the relevant number of chefs, depending on the size of the wedding, a front of house manager. So all of our weddings have a front of house manager because we're not in a venue with a, an event planner or a, a venue manager. And we need to keep everything ticking along smoothly and running smoothly. So we have a front of house manager, a waiting team. We include in our quote crockery, cutlery, linen, um, glassware. We don't actually include glassware, but that's a long story, so I won't bore you with that. But as a general, if it's spelt out that you would expect as the, the absolute basics, the waiting stuff, the food, the, the linen, the crockery and cutlery. And and would that also sort of your price also include that creative process of selecting your menu of yes. things as well? Yes. yes. So, it, yes, actually, that's a good point. Um, so it would include, <clears throat> excuse me, a consultation with me. These days, um, most of them are Zoomy ever since mm-hmm. the lovely pandemic. Um, So we'd have a consultation, which is not, you know, it's nice. So it includes a consultation with me, more than one if we can't get it right on the first time, which is rare. Any amount of tweaking, if I can make it, you can have it. Um, The menu creation. We also include a large part of project management, which is also important. I've alluded to that with the front of house manager, but we have done this over 600 times. You guys haven't. 
and you're, and, <laughs> and you're going it, and you're going it alone you know so we help you pull that day together so basically your your caterer if they're as good as us dare i say it would also help you um you know help you to plan it you know so we call that project management the administrative side of a wedding as you will know is a minefield because you don't oh my gosh you don't Absolutely. know how long it takes to serve three courses you don't know what time you're going to have to come from there to there to do that so you know a good caterer would help you plan that and we do so that's that's also included in the price i think that that's a really important point actually because you know you and you've done this as you say 600 times so you understand how the administration process for the catering in in particular would yes. work so yes why wouldn't you use Impart that it yes yeah. we do so we we issue a fantastic checklist um it's likened to an a-level paper but people love it in the end and basically what it does is ask the bride and groom millions of questions about what we need to know to make that day look effortless. So mm. what time do you want your drinks reception? Where, Where? what's your um, wet weather alternative? All of those, you know, whole section on food, allergies, dietaries, all of that sort of thing. We use it as a Bible. So together we're a team, the bride and groom and the caterer, because we're planning this, the, the food element. And, and, you know, the important thing about outside catering food is, um, the timings and the choreography of the day so the photographer hasn't nipped you off for 15 minutes that we didn't know about whilst your chicken's going dry these are important yeah. things yeah and that that's a really great point as well because obviously at the same time especially when you're going from some dry high venues do have a kitchen that you can use but you know yeah. if, especially if you're in the market in a marquee in the middle of nowhere you know timings are really important because yeah you know you don't really have that space to store things and as you say prevent the chicken from going dry i think the timings need to be every every day every wedding has to have choreography and we help with that a lot because we know the timings we know how long it takes to do this we know how long it takes to do the other it's not military we work with the bride and groom this is all part of the service we offer so that if you say you want a two hour drinks reception with canapes, that's absolutely fine. And then we work out, therefore, what time we need to bring everybody in to sit down because we've agreed what time the starter gets served. And it takes 20 minutes to seat, you know, 100 people or whatever. So all of those things are important things that we as caterers know about and you don't. And therefore, you know, we help you with it. It's one of the largest operational aspects, isn't it? It is. It really is. I think that leads us nicely on to talking about the actual logistics of hiring a caterer for your day. I mean, there must be quite a few different things that a couple may wish to consider, probably prior to even picking their venue at this point. Yes. I mean, I think that quite rightly, the last thing that couples consider when picking their venue is where the poor caterer is going to cook their food from. <laughs> um, so, yes, I mean, they should choose the venue. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Most venues that we're talking about, these dry high venues, on the whole, have an empty space, okay? And that empty space, the venue will have decided is their catering kitchen, for want of a better word. Um, and it's up to the caterer, not the client, mostly it's up to the caterer to make that space work, and we would, the A's, we're very much can do caterers, but if necessary, if the client was worried about it, we would liaise direct with the venue that they're thinking of booking to see how it's been done before. That's what I mean about reinventing the wheel. As long as we've got space and adequate space, trestle tables to lay out on, and the space is adjacent to where we're serving the wedding breakfast, we bring in everything else, okay? So we equip that kitchen. In some cases, if, it, if it's a marquee, we would always need a catering tent. 
And again, that catering tent needs to be attached to the main marquee. I can tell you lots of stories about when there have been gaps between the catering tent and the marquee. It's called <laughs> flying salad, flying <laughs> lettuce, or, you know, worse than that, the SOM experience, because the ground between the catering tent and the marquee, it's poured down with rain. And so every time the waitresses go to and forth, it just gets muddier and muddier and muddier. Yeah. So there's, you know, when caterers ask for things, it's not because we're wanting to be a diva and have a rider with, you know, 100 white lilies and some Krug. It's basically, it's logistical. It's, it's yeah. that's what we need. So, yeah, they, so they would need to think about that. But as I say, it's mostly give the problem to the caterer. Again, we as caterers have what we call, say this quickly, a catering tent spec sheet. And before booking us, you know, we send that out to the bride and groom so that they can make sure that our basic requirements are met. <laughs> that is definitely a tongue twister. I it is. <laughs> I know. It's, don't say it when you've had a gin. Um, <laughs> so what would that sort of spec sheet cover? The spec sheet that we send out covers um, the literally the amount of space we would need. Don't ask me what it is because it's Richard who's logistics. But <laughs> say, say you've got 100 guests at a wedding, you would need a minimum amount of, say, I don't know, say it's 33 square metres of catering tent because you've got to fit in an oven, a warming cupboard, 10 trestle tables to prep the food on and lay it out on. So again, it's it's really just, so it's physically the space that we need to work in, two chefs in there, um, and um, that's the space we need. It would cover whether we need, you know, we need a water supply, so where is it? It doesn't have to, believe it or not, be a tap. Many times it isn't in a catering tent but it needs to be a standpipe that perhaps you've run a food grade hose from, from your garden tap or something like that. So we need a nearby water supply. We'd need electricity, obviously. So it would tell you how much we need so that the marquee provider, if that's the case, would be able to put the relevant generator in and all that sort of thing. We don't need much because we cook on gas. Um, lighting is important. People think they're getting married in the summer and therefore you don't need any lighting. But if you've got a fridge trailer with all your booze in it and it's going on till one o'clock in the morning and it's dark, we need to be able to see what we're doing or we're packing away, that type of thing. So it just covers the absolute basics, but, you know, the vitals. Yeah, and it is vital that you know what you're walking into to be able to deliver yes. what the couple is expecting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. One of the things, just going back to what is involved, what you should have for your price, is that most caterers, and again, I'll blow our trumpets, we do it. We have, <laughs> a, we have a setup meeting with the client two days before the wedding, when all the crockery and the cutlery and everything gets delivered and it's all mayhem. The marquee's up or the venue, you know, you're allowed to use your venue from, say, day the Friday or something like that. Richard or one of our other managers, managers goes on site checks off every last bit of crockery, cutlery, teaspoons and all the rest of it because you're halfway up the Peak District and you can't go and find any from anywhere else. Um, and walks through the day with the bride and groom to give them reassurance. You know, this is where we thought on paper we were going to set up your drinks reception. But actually, do you know what? It would be better over there because the sun's coming from that direction or it's raining. So what should we do about that? So that's also part of what we do, that sort of setup. Um, and that we also at that point set up our kitchen so that when the chef comes in cold on Saturday morning, it's all ready to cook. Amazing. And so I think actually that leads quite nicely into the question of what questions should me and my partner be asking if and when we are at a dry hire venue or speaking to a marquee company that will ensure that our caterers are going to be equipped with what they need. Yes. Again, most the dry hire company, the dry hire venue, if it's a, a structure, um, you don't, you know, they will have done this a million times. And so the only thing that you would have to be very careful of from the bride and groom's point of view is where is this kitchen situated? Because if it's situated 
miles away from where we're serving you, sometimes it wouldn't work. So we need to suggest that the venue or the client has to put up a, a, a catering tent, even though there's a kitchen. Just, you know, I, I, I wouldn't want it a, a venue, people to get too worried about it. As I say, we are very much can do, but it's worth asking the venue what previous caterers have done to make that work. So that by the time they come to us, they say, oh, well, they had a wedding last week and they, the caterers used it in X, Y, Z way. And then we take it up with the venue and make it work. With a marquee, again, all marquee companies know what a caterer needs. Um, and the only thing you would as a client, as you, a bride and groom, need to be careful of is really that conjoined, the size of it and that it's completely joined up to the, to the marquee. Um, yeah. Now, again, logistically, nine times out of and that works sometimes it doesn't because if you're having a marquee in your garden and your garden's a certain size and you can't fit any more in um you know sometimes that isn't quite as easy as i'm making it sound mm -hmm. in which case we would go along and speak to the marquee company and work out a layout that is going to be helpful for everybody and if we can't have a conjoined catering tent, you know, is there some way that during service we can have a tunnel so that it's covered? Yeah, so that's just, I mean, it's, it's a bit common sense, but it's easy for me to say because I'm the caterer. Um, don't, don't overly um, uh, make sure that you check with the caterer really would be your, your biggest thing. Before you book anything, make sure that you just check with the caterer, unless it's blindingly obvious. <laughs> yeah, it's a really good point. And just sort of asking those questions that to them, if you if you feel it's a concern or if you're worried about something, actually speaking and communicating. Yes. Your caterer is going to be. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I love all of our brides and grooms dearly. I really do. But you'd be amazed at how many in the 12 years in business say, oh, I'm sure you can cater from that, can't you? And it's a space the size of my home kitchen. And, you know, you go, I'm, look, I'm about to serve 100 meals at the same time. Where am I served? You know, how am I doing this? So keep that, you know, I'm not asking you to bow to your caterer, but bear in mind what they are going to do for you and from what, you know, from what uh, facilities. Yeah, and I think that, that it's, it's quite a massive part of the day, really. I mean, you know, when you when you go to a wedding as a guest, what do you expect? You expect to see someone get married. You expect to uh, eat some good food yeah. and you expect to have a good old boogie on the dance floor. Sure. Um, so it's one of those major aspects of the day. Um, yeah. So actually making sure that you have the right level of communication with that supplier is yeah. really important. And also that supplier is with you all day. Most of them aren't, you know, the florist comes and puts the float fl flowers on and they're gorgeous. And the cake person comes and puts the cake and it's gorgeous. The caterer is there all day. Um, you know, as we said in the early days, building a restaurant from scratch and about to serve amazing restaurant quality food to your hundred odd guests. So, you know, be nice to your caterer as well, you know, understand, you know, I mean, you're paying good money for it. That's absolutely a given, but understand, you know, what, what they are going to achieve from this space. Amazing. I think I'd like to sort of, uh, sort of start finishing the episode just by asking you like what kind of trends are you seeing at the moment uh in terms of the catering world for weddings yeah well interesting at, at the beginning of of uh, sorry no towards the end middle to end of last year i there was one major thing that i thought was happening and that was that people were having smaller weddings this isn't food related particularly but that's that has changed so I won't say that. However, um, um, there's still there is a still an ongoing trend for a much more relaxed vibe. So it's not new particularly, but it's still there. There's far less formality around weddings. It's still a wedding, so it's it's going to look amazing. But there's far people. Most people want a relaxed feel to their wedding sharing still plays an enormous part if that's your if that's your bag grazing tables visually spectacular 
in place of canapes, say, so little charcuterie tables and things like that are very popular, although I would caveat that and say weather dependent, and mm. we are in England. The other thing that is, you mentioned it right at the very beginning, people do like this idea of, of you know, food trucks, street mm. food, if you like. And, and whilst I, I sort of get that, because who doesn't like that sort of food? Logistically, it's not it's not the easiest thing for your guests mm. you know so you might have a couple of food trucks but your guests have to get up and queue mm. you know and things like that it still remains a trend and what we try to do is bring the food truck to your table so don't have a food truck I can make that food have a noodle bar but to each table so thing, things like that are still still very prevalent to be honest I don't know I'm not spotting any great new food fad particularly mm. we've all done middle eastern now and that remains very popular um and as i say what, share. Kind of, what kind of middle eastern food are you seeing mostly well otolenghi has a, a played a huge part in the past but now you know there are uh, rest, um, uh, cooks like sabrina guy or so things like let me think baked halloumis in like rose harissa and honey um little boards of dips you know baba ganoush lemon and coriander hummus a lovely dip called muhamara, flatbreads, um, pickles, olives. Um, I'm trying to think of other Middle Eastern. Oh, we do. I call it a Mediterranean feast. You can have a real mixture of things, really. But that, you know, those sort of Middle Eastern -y flavors, sometimes, um, you know, little polpette, so meatballs without the meat, um, gorgeously interesting salads with um, a lot of pomegranate molasses and things like that. Those are always very popular. Yeah. I'm probably saying it because I love that sort of food. So I think it sounds beautiful. <laughs> yeah, and my mouth's watering now and I'm not really hungry. So yeah, those things are popular. Yeah, that, that's a really good insight. You know, I, I personally didn't consider Middle Eastern food and sort of, even though I love that kind of food, it's not yeah. that sort of triggered in my mind but that that's just me in my personal well the other great thing about things like that is that certainly for starters if you had that sort of middle eastern -y mediterranean vibe lots of it is naturally vegetarian so you don't have to have the klaxon vegetarian situation um so yes it's all it's very popular yeah, I think that's a really good, that's a really good way um, to sort of wrap up. I think my final thing for you will be, what is your biggest tip for couples who are considering going for an outside caterer at the moment? My biggest tip would be honest and open and straightforward communication on both parts. Mm. I think nice and concise. Perfect. Thank you so much, Karen. It's Thank been you. lovely to chat to you. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you for having me. Oh, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast and chatting all things food with us today. As always, we'll put more information about Kemp and Kemp in our show notes for you all. And we'll link to their social media as well as to our own at Guides for Brides. Give us a follow. Give Kemp and Kemp a follow. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Enjoy your wedding planning and try not to get too hungry listening to the episode. <laughs>